There we go. And with that, I, once again, I'd like to introduce Susan Gilliland, who will introduce our speaker for tonight. Susan. Thank you very much, Ron. Well, Los Angeles Birders is very pleased to have Alvaro Jaramillo with us again tonight. Alvaro earned his BS in zoology and his master's degree in ecology and evolution from the University of Toronto and is currently an affiliated senior biologist with the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. Many of us have joined Alvaro on a pelagic trip out of Northern California, or perhaps even gone further afield, such as to the Galapagos Islands through Alvaro's company, Alvaro's Adventures. Not only is he an expert on pelagic birds, he's also a leading authority on the birds of Chile and has authored the Birds of Chile and is collaborating on Chile's important bird areas program. Alvaro's passion is not only to understand the biology and natural history of birds, but to improve other people's enjoyment of birds and further avian conservation. As such, Alvaro is a recipient of the Eisenman Medal of the Linnaean Society of New York, which honors people who excel in ornithology and encourage amateurs. Alvaro is also an expert on the birds of California and North America and has written several books, including ABA's Field Guide to Birds of California and the New World Blackbirds. And tonight, Alvaro will be entering that introducing us to the New World Blackbirds that despite their name, include the colorful Orioles and Troupials. So sit back and relax. We're in for an instructive and fun evening with Alvaro at the helm. So please welcome Alvaro Jaramillo. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that introduction and for inviting me back. Um, we Let me start sharing the screen here and uh, hopefully you're seeing that, but- yeah. um, Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, the, you know, I'm uh, often giving talks uh, about bird identification. And uh, last time I talked to you, I was talking about gulls. But this time, I think it's going to be a, a kind of a, a tour through the new world, uh, the Americas, and through it kind of telling you little stories about icterids, new world, new world blackbirds. And um, a little bit of my experience with them, what I've read about them, what I've uh, worked on with them and uh, also give you an appreciation for this this family of birds which is really to you know to me i think they're the most interesting passerine birds in in the americas just incredibly um cool birds so i'm going to try and convince you that blackbirds are pretty cool so if i if i have one person that says yeah those are pretty cool i think i will have achieved what i wanted to do here but i think one of the things that we have an issue with as birders is we are so often immediately uninterested in the common, right? We always are gravitating to the rare, but we forget that for a lot of people in, in North America, you know, the red-winged blackbird was one of the things that first stuck out as like, wow, look at that, you know, with the, the red epaulets and the black plumage. And, you know, you, you first are sort of enthralled by this creature and seeing that it's doing all sorts of interesting stuff. And then you realize it's common and you forget to look at it. So I also wanna see if some people might start looking at blackbirds more as, uh, as the year goes on, as you sort of start thinking, yeah, you know, I should look at what they're doing, what's happening, um, because there's a lot going on when blackbirds are around. Um, so the, the real blackbird is, is a thrush, right? In Europe, it's called, you know, the blackbird. And, the name was transferred incorrectly to birds we call blackbirds, which are a different family, the icterids, that are more closely related to warblers, our new world warblers, not the old world warblers. So it gets confusing. This transfer of the name from the European birds to the, um, the um, new world birds also happened in Spanish. So the, the word for blackbird is tordo, and tordo is blackbird, tortoise, right? So we, we done the same thing in multiple languages. And it kind of makes sense. There, you know, a lot of these birds are black, but icterids actually means yellow, yellow birds, like this, you know, oriole uh, blackbird. And there are, you know, I mean, the, the, the crowbar joke was good. It's a good joke, but the crows are not actually icterids. And it is hard to find jokes about icterids. I get it. Um, but often they are uh, these birds are confused with starlings, you know, crows, and are they all blackbirds? Well, they are birds that are black, but they're not actually icterids, New World blackbirds. 
One thing that I will point out about starlings, though, is that they share a way of feeding with New World blackbirds that is actually kind of unique, is they're able to open the bill with pressure. Like, actually, they have special muscles that are, that are stronger and, you know, more rigid, uh, you know, all, to open the bill uh, under pressure, to open up holes in, in, in the ground. And that is something that starlings do and New World blackbirds, but a lot of other passerine birds do not do that. Um, so we have the yellow birds and some of our um, icterids are indeed yellow like metal arts, others are indeed black like Brewer's blackbird. And a lot of them have special patches of color like you know, on the shoulders or on the head, et cetera, that, you know, et cetera, that are known as the flash colors. Now, my interest in in Icterid started because I, I did my master's work on South American cowbirds and then got so interested in this group that while I was doing my PhD, I started kind of collecting information about them. And eventually I left my PhD because I wasn't as interested in it as in, in finishing this book on blackbirds. So it's uh, replaced my PhD to write this book uh, with my friend Peter Burke, who was the illustrator and also collaborator in, you know, since we were teenagers, we've been birding together. Um, and so some of this comes from that book, but also a lot of things have happened since then. A lot of the taxonomy has changed. A lot of things have changed and I've tried to keep up, but so much is going on that I'm obviously still behind. But the, you know, if you kind of look at today's family tree of icterids, there are a few things to look at there. There's a group, these sort of, if you take each one of these groups back to their branch here, these are subfamilies within the family. So this whole branch here are the mainly black blackbirds, the cowbirds, the grackles, the red winged blackbird. There is um, a branch for the Orioles, a branch for the uh, caciques nor pendulas. And then there are actually three different branches for metal arts, um, bobolink, and yellow-headed blackbird. Yellow-headed blackbird is actually a really weird blackbird. It's not closely related to most others. So get this, you know, this yellow-headed blackbird is actually more closely related to a metal arc than it is to these tricolored blackbirds. It is actually, even though ecologically, it is similar in some ways to red-winged blackbirds and marsh-nesting blackbirds, it is kind of its own thing. In fact, it's a some people say it's an independent subfamily within the group. Um, another thing that's relatively new is that the yellow-breasted chat, which people used to think was a new world warbler, is now in its, on its own, in its own family, and it's perhaps the closest relative to the new world blackbirds without being a blackbird itself. And this caused sort of a weird issue in that um, it has a very similar uh, name for its family, just in differing in, in a letter. But this um, talk, I'm going to tell you about blackbirds in the Americas throughout. And we tend to really make divisions between the different parts of, of the New World, um, be, you know, in terms of North America, South America, but it sort of, you know, in a way, it all sort of blends together in some ways. There's differences here and there. There are different avifaunal breaks here and there, and one group that is throughout the entire um, New World it, are the blackbirds, you know, from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego. So not all of our New World birds are that widespread. So there are tropical members, there are temperate members, there are Caribbean members, they're all over the place. And I just put this other map here to show you that historically, we've shifted all around the place. Colonialism has happened all over the Americas. And in fact, when you really get down to it, North America and South America have more similarity in the history than they do differences. Um, and uh, in a way, blackbirds kind of tie us in all together. But we're going to start with North America, a place that has forests, marshes, you, you know, mountains, all sorts of habitats, tundra. Um, and perhaps the, the group that, you know, a lot of people think of as, as the classic um, North American blackbirds are those that nest in marshes. And I already told you that these two, red-winged blackbird and yellow-headed blackbird, are not even closely related. But they do nest in marshes, and they have these territories that they defend 
in marshy areas or sometimes even moist shrubby areas, particularly for the uh, red winged blackbird. Then they then have females come in and set up um, shop in the territories of the males. What is interesting in red winged blackbirds and yellow headed blackbirds, the females have a sub territory within the territory of the male that they defend against other females. And and this idea of polygyny, having more than one female nesting with a male, is not rare in the animal world. But one of the things that's, uh, I think, interesting in, in the, the Icterid is that people studied it early on in the 60s and 70s. And they realized that only when a male had a really great territory, that was a, there was a lot of food right in that territory, would a female choose to mate with a male that already had a female associated with him, that he was already paired. So she would, that second female decide, okay, this male I will pair with because there's enough space in here for me to raise my young and he's defending this whole space. So um, what she was choosing in a sense is the quality of that space that that male was defending and decided that it was okay to mate with a male that already had a female. And that threshold of when a female chooses to be polygynous depends on the quality of the habitat. And there was an entire paper written called the polygyny threshold um, um, model. And it is based on blackbirds. And it's, uh, you know, pe some people say it works, some people don't say it works, but this is one of the first uh, studies done to understand why a female would ever want to be polygynous in, in birds. We also have these great um, stunning birds in the backyards in a lot of California, the hooded orioles, which are, um, known for liking these Washingtonia fan palms and making these hanging nests made out of the little, you know, sort of stringy bits that the palms provide. So they're really associated with palms. They're very long, these, these orioles. And as, anytime I show you an oriole, just watch the bill, how much gray there is in the bill and the, the shape of the bill. I, I think you could identify a lot of orioles just from how much gray, and at least the males, and what the bill shape is. Um, and I uh, just keep that in mind. Um, and Orioles come in three different groups, but I wanted to show you that this group here includes the hooded Oriole, which is in here. And these are all Orioles that are kind of thin, long billed long tailed and they have a real association with palm trees throughout their range. A lot of them are, are from the Caribbean and um, Interestingly enough, there was a, a morphologist that studied just skulls of, of birds that in the 70s proposed that all these birds should be considered a different genus that he called bananivorous, right? And I guess it means banana eaters. But um, the, it, it, when they did the DNA work, actually that group turns out to be a real group that is sort of you know, mirrored with the morphology and now the genetics. There's a middle group here that includes a series of orioles that all have white on the wing, which is sort of weird, sort of weird character. That includes the true peels and also spot-breasted oriole. And then there's the sort of bigger orioles that include our bullocks, Baltimore, black-backed, you know, um, and um, streak-backed orioles and so forth. So three different groups of orioles that we have in, in, in the world. Now, within that group, that third group, we have the Baltimore and Bullocks, and they hybridize, which is interesting because if you go back here to this tree of relationships, you'll see that um, here's one of our guys, and here's the other one. Bullocks is over here, and Baltimore's over there. They're not side by side on the family tree. They're not each other's closest relatives. In fact, Bullocks is more closely related to streak-backed and Baltimore is more closely related to black-backed or Abel's Orioles, the old name for that. And, um, but yet they hybridize, very different in their pattern. Um, look at how much gray they have on the bill. Actually, some of them almost look like they're entirely gray except for the ridge of, of the you know, sort of the top of the bill. And where this happens is in the middle of North America. So. If you were to take the two distributions of Bullocks and Baltimore, right along here is where they hybridize. And there's a narrow zone, you know, we're talking 70 miles or so, maybe a little longer, depending on where you are, where 
if you go to the middle of that hybrid zone in the breeding area, believe it or not, every single Oriole you will see is a hybrid, a mix. And they, the males are actually quite easy to tell, you know, that they're hybrids because the features are so obvious. The females less so. But I had the good fortune of when I was a student of traveling to this part of the world to study hybrid Orioles with my supervisor at the time, Jim Rising, who has passed away since then. Jim was an expert on savanna sparrows and sparrows taxonomy. And also he had done work in the 70s on this hybrid uh, zone. And he wanted to re sort of look at the hybrid zone 20 years later. And that's what we did. And in fact, the hybrid zone had not shifted. It was roughly exactly where it had been in the past, you know, give or take. And the, the decline of change between the two species was still very steep. It went from, you know, sort of Bullocks over here to Baltimore over here with this really sort of steep um, series of, of intermediates in this narrow zone that they call a step decline. And in fact, that suggested without using genetics at the time, just using morphology, that the hybrid zone was stable and that in fact, genes were not just flowing freely between these two populations, but that they were being kept stable probably by the environment. One environment being drier to the west, the other one being wetter to the east. But um, that, that has now you know, been confirmed that they're not even each other's closest relatives. So we have now again, two species, although for a period of time, they were lumped as one. Now, coloniality. Right, coloniality, you know, I like seabirds. You think about a lot of colonial seabirds from MERS to um, Lazan albatrosses. Very few birds are colonial that are terrestrial. One of them, in fact, was the passenger pigeon. Coloniality in terrestrial birds makes them really vulnerable because they're all kind of tightly together. Um, and if you go and think about the Central Valley, we have there one of the only colonial land birds in the Americas, and that's the tricolored blackbird. Tricolored blackbirds are so colonial that they don't have territories. They're completely different than red wings that defend these territories. They will nest, you know, side by side, sing side by side with each other. They're, um, they um, do time everything so that they do everything all at the same time so that when the eggs and the young are out, there's so much um, happening that any one predator cannot kind of, you know, sort of do away with all of the birds. There's just too many of them. That was the original strategy. In fact, there used to be, when before, you know, we changed uh, the Central Valley, there were single colonies of tri tricolored blackbirds that are larger than the entire remaining world population. So they've decreased by a huge amount and um, also think about how vulnerable they are, given that they are colonial and think about those passenger pigeons that people sort of said, they're so common. No, you know, they're, they're always gonna be common. That's not the case. These birds have a very specific kind of weakness, which is coloniality, which was their strength before we messed up the environment uh, in, in where they are, in, at least in the Central Valley, it started draining and so forth and moving water around. But it's a very special bird and very different from a uh, red-winged blackbird, even though we think of them as being really similar. Um, here's uh, pictures tricolored, our California bicolored blackbird that is a, is a red wing that doesn't have yellow on the epaulets, on the edge of the epaulets. We um, spent a lot of time trying to illustrate these in, in, in our, our book and I eventually wrote an article about differentiating female tricolored from bicolored and it's really tough. It's actually one of the toughest problems that I still struggle with in terms of bird identification in California. Um, often people just say, oh, well, where they're, they're with tricolors, they must all be tricolored females. Um, but this issue of the bicolored blackbird is interesting in that it genetically now we know that bicolored, California bicolored blackbirds are more closely related to the Mexican population of bicolored blackbirds that also don't have the yellow on the edge, but they seem to be being engulfed over the last, you know, 100,000 years by the typical red wing. So it's difficult to call them a different species, but they might have been in the past. They might be being sort of engulfed. And this one's a tough one. It's a real gray area. But in my backyard in the winter, I sometimes get both, females of both. And they're like night and day when you see sort of the, the California bicolored, very dark 
versus these um, northwestern red wings, uh, Carinus subspecies. And they'll be right next to each other. They often, um, they don't flock together. They actually, when they fly off, they fly off in each other's separate flocks. Um, so it's something to sort of keep an eye out in various places in, in California. In the Great Plains, we have the meadowlarks, of course, that are, you know, amazingly potent singers. Eastern and Western meadowlarks, very similar, but different songs. Um, and let me play you, you know, so you probably know the Western song. And the Eastern, whoops, I messed it up. Eastern songs kind of droop and they're high pitched. Um, the West, Western sort of go up and down and are lower pitched. And then there's this other bird that's in the desert Southwest and into Mexico that sounds kind of in between. This um, Lillian's or, or maybe Chihuahuan meadowlark, I'm not sure what the final name will be, is, is similar in song to the, to the Eastern. In fact, we consider it an Eastern a subspecies, the Eastern right now. But this work by Johanna Bream uh, recently, 2021, um, may mean that this species will be separated. I think this will happen. But um, the name might end up being Chihuahuan rather than Lillian's. I'm not sure what the choices will be. But um, it's interesting that although the song is similar, it's lower pitch, so it sounds like a Western. Yet um, it is differentiated morphologically and differentiated in song. What I wanted to point out too is that this metal art issue may not be done. This one over here is the one from Cuba and the Cuban Eastern metal arc is also a kind of a different branch and has actually very different morphology to my eye and also different songs. So we may end up with, you know, another um, metal arc over time. If you go to South America, the um, metal arcs become all red breasted. So really beautiful birds like um, this one actually now is called the white broad metal arc. They changed the name long tailed metal arcs. And um, thinking, you know, back to yellow headed blackbird when you're um, going down to South America, you have this convergence in look from other blackbirds that are not related to the yellowhead. And in fact, these two aren't even related to each other all that closely within the blackbird family tree, the yellow hooded and scarlet headed blackbird. It's interesting that sort of the, in, in icterids, similar patterns um, show up again and again, colored heads or colorful epaulets, colorful rumps. It sort of goes back and forth and some relatives have them and others do not. Later, I'll show you a picture of the closest relative to the scarlet headed, which is an entirely black species called the Austral blackbird. In the um, grackle group, um, there's a lot going on. And I'll tell you a little bit more about grackle breeding strategies. But in this picture, I'll just mention that something that's always I find kind of fascinating is that to some extent, common grackle and brewer's blackbird ecologically separate out as sort of similar birds ecologically when there's urbanization. So in urban zones in the West, Brewer's Blackbird becomes sort of the parking lot bird. In the East, common grackle becomes the parking lot bird. If you see common grackles in actual native habitats, they tend to be kind of lake edge swamp birds, completely different habitat than what you sort of think of them as, as liking in, in other, in more suburban areas. But the common grackle is always the one in the parking lots until you know it gets far enough west that it it drops off and then from that point on brewers blackbirds take over as the parking lot bird yet brewers blackbirds within the range of common blackbird become really specialist on on very flat dirt fields so really short grass dirt fields is where they will hang out and common grackles, not so much. It's really sort of an odd situation that happens between those two. And then Brewers has his relative, the rusty blackbird, which is dark like this during the breeding season and truly rusty in the non-breeding season. They become amazingly colorful. And it is a bird that is aquatic, um, really closely tied to swamps and aquatic vegetation. And they've been 
suggested to be on a really long-term decline in populations. And some people have thought that it's water quality that's changing in the north. At one point, acid rain was being blamed. Other people think it's pesticides in the southern part of their range when they winter that is affecting water quality and, and these birds are not surviving to the extent that they used to. Um, but long-term decline in rusty blackbirds. And we now are heading south from North America down into Mesoamerica, Central America, places where a lot of our migrant birds go to, a lot of our warblers and so forth, but also some of our ictorids like this orchard oriole and hooded orioles go down there. And I always tell people, you know, that we kind of think of them as our birds, but they're sort of birds we share with all of the countries that they fly through. So if this, you know, bird is orchard orioles in Guatemala, it might be, you know, that the their bird for a while and we get to borrow it, you know, and uh, as a vagrant in California and Easterners get to borrow it as a breeder. And it's interesting to think about how these birds connect us. Um, in Central America, there are a lot of places that birders go to that are partially there because of, you know, conservation, also for coffee production. And some places kind of mix everything uh, this place called Los Andes Reserve in Guatemala was great in that it was a coffee finca that had this whole conservation program and fully educated all the local kids. And um, I always thought that was sort of a really great model for the way it could be in some places and, in, 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 you know, that produce coffee. Unfortunately, they're not all like that, but uh, Los Andes was a great spot and great place to watch birds like, you know, black vented oriole. Nearby, there were bar winged orioles, which are really sort of an unusual species from that part of the world. This is the bar wing. Really bad picture because they don't see them that often. And, and you go down there and you have all of these different orioles in Central America that have um, different, well, you know, behaviors in their migration and so, and so forth. Some of them are completely resident and others are not. But I thought I'd point out the one we know, Bullock's oriole and point out that sort of the adult males are, are bright and the adult females have a duller plumage color, but still with color. And then young males kind of look a little bit in between with sort of some elements of the adult male, but more female-like perhaps. And so they delay maturation and there's sexual dimorphism, males and females look different. And then you, you look at the, the whole span of, of these Central American Orioles and um, like some, like spot-breasted or Altamira oriole, they're resident and they hang out all the time in the same places. They don't migrate. They don't have to spend time forming a pair bond because they're, they're hanging out with their mate the whole year round. And what's interesting is in those cases, the non-migratory types, the females become male-like in plumage and they also help defend territories. Females can sing and so forth. So we have this idea of like the fact that migratory orioles are the ones that become dimorphic and resident orioles are the ones that maintain a monomorphic but male-like plumage, not adult plumage, bright plumage. And the cool one to look at is streak-backed oriole because streak-backed orioles in the south are, are resident and then they are both male and females look alike. And the ones in the north that are migratory, the males and females are actually different in coloration. So within one species, although some people would separate them as multiple species, you get the two patterns of um, color. And great places to visit when you're in Central America, either in the mountains or in the lowlands in the Petén, you can go to Tikal, watch the more blackbirds and watch you know, orange-breasted falcons. But one of the most, uh, if you go there in the breeding season, one of the most sort of showy birds you will see is Montezuma or Pendula, which are huge, colorful, and they do these, crazy displays, right? And the males will be, you know, there'd be a single male in the area with sort of satellite males nearby defending this whole group of nesting females, sometimes many of them. In fact, big, bigger colonies will have multiple males at them, smaller colonies, just one male. But what happens is the females are clumping to avoid predation um, and, and they, predation from monkeys and, and some, some um, raptors. So they clump, the more clump they are, actually the, the less likely they're gonna be predated. Single nests are, are more likely to be predated. 
So they all come together because that improves their chance of surviving, you know, their young surviving. But once they're clumped together, the males have evolved to sort of like dominate that group of females, uh, at least the area. They don't dominate the females, they dominate the space. And then the females more likely mate with that male, although sometimes they run off and mate with another male elsewhere. And that way of, of behaving is actually super rare in birds. It's called harem defense polygyny. And it happens mostly in mammals. Like you can think of, you know, red deer, elk, um, elephant seals, these, you know, and multiple other seals and, you know, sea lion groups that, that are defending a area where the females are clumping and the males become huge. The biggest difference is if of any, you know, mammal size between males and females is something like an elephant seal. The biggest differences in male to female size are in, in birds is in the oropendulous. Actually, they are exactly doing the same thing. And the other group that does the same kind of thing are gray tail and bow tail grackles. So harem defense polygyny so far, I think, only occurs in icterids in the birds. And they have the biggest size differences between male and females of any um, birds, passerines at least, that I know of in, in the new world, I think anywhere else, I might be wrong. But uh, that's why it seems to be happening. Um, song is interesting in, in icterids, and I'll play you one you might know, red-winged blackbird. Sort of not the most pleasant of songs, but here's a yellow-backed oriole. If you're ever in a place where there's yellow-backed orioles and you think you hear some guy whistling, you know, walking down the trail, so you know, sort of a jolly guy whistling, that's a yellow-backed oriole. That's how you tell you're, you're seeing a yellow-backed oriole or hearing at least a yellow-backed oriole. The real variation in song from sweet to raspy um, vocalizations. But one of the, the birds that I say is the king of all frequencies, because if you do a spectrogram, you have a song that has super low notes and then parts that are super high. In fact, beyond what most humans can hear. And the king of all frequencies sounds like this. And we can slow it down so you can hear more of what it sounds like, but it's the brown headed cowbird. And that is not the most beautiful song in the world, I know, but the fact that it can go from, you know, super low to super high in this short amount of time. And to think about the fact that these birds probably understand that song um, in a way that processes the information much more quickly than we can, that is an amazing song. It's just not amazing to our ears necessarily. Um, there are orioles, multiple orioles that actually will do mimicry, believe it or not. This is an epaulet oriole. Um, well, I guess it's changed names now, but variable orioles, the new name, uh, that would do mimicry and multiple other orioles will actually incorporate mimicry. So from Central America, we're going to pop over quickly to the Caribbean, and then we're going to go and finish up in South America, where I did some work on cowbirds. The Caribbean is like really complicated uh, in many ways. Um, geologically, the, the geologists argue about where some of these islands actually came from. There's evidence that some of the birds and creatures that are there came from further west. And there's also um, really clear cut evidence that what remains in the Caribbean includes a lot of kind of living fossils, things that have gone extinct on the mainland, but remain on the Caribbean, um, birds and other creatures that used to be much more widespread elsewhere. And, um, you know, you can think of this mammal, the Selenodon, uh, has a couple of species down there that's not found anywhere else on earth and its closest relatives are all in the old world. The toadies used to be widespread in the Americas. In fact, some even in Europe way back and they're only left 
in the Caribbean. The oldest lineage of New World Trogons, um, New World, you know, you can go on and on with this, like, you know, the New World Pygmy Owls, multiple other groups. The oldest lineages are all in the Caribbean, not on the mainland of Central or South America. There are full-on families like the toadies that are endemic to, to the Caribbean, palm chat, multiple things that have now been split from the warblers and tanagers, um, one of them being the Cuban warblers. So this is an Oriente warbler. And, it, you know, it's a great place to visit because there are multiple islands, lots of endemics, beautiful beaches, great food. Um, if you go to Puerto Rico, you can also see things that are really rare, like the yellow-shouldered blackbird. That is a species that's restricted just a couple of patches of habitat, and it's suffered from habitat loss as well as cowbird, um, shiny cowbird brood parasitism. Its closest relative is in Cuba and um, Dominican Republic, the tawny shouldered blackbird. Or I should say Haiti, not Dominican Republic, it's on the Haiti side. And these birds have epaulets, just like red winged blackbirds. And in fact, they're sort of relatively closely related to our red wing and tricolored, but you know, actually different enough to be in a different subgroup. Um, a place I always have wanted to visit, yet I've, haven't been there yet, is Jamaica that has multiple species that are unique. And every one of the islands seems to have an endemic orioles or blackbirds of some kind. One of the things I really would like to see one day is the Jamaican blackbird, which is this funky blackbird with its long spiky bill that eats in bromeliads, those sort of, you know, spiky bromeliads that are up in the trees. And over there, they call it the pine sergeant. Well, do, do, I think it's song, the uh, Jamaican oriole, which is a kind of a weird greenish looking oriole, is called the anti Katie. So uh, looking forward to my first visit one day to Jamaica, where I have been though, and is really interesting is the Lesser Antilles, all these little islands, you know, south of Puerto Rico and north of uh, Trinidad and Tobago. They, all the red ones here have volcanic activity or ex, you know, volcanoes. And then the ones that are on the outside actually are limestone. So we have two different geologic formations and one of them, Guadalupe, is um, as both. Actually it's two different islands of completely different origins stuck together. Um, Montserrat is a place where I visited once to try to scout for a tour, and it's known as the island where the half of the island was wiped out by this volcano, Soufriere Hill, and we nearly lost a species of Oriole due to that, this um, volcano. But um, when I visited, I actually got to see the volcano spill out ash and do just amazing things, and it's far enough away that you know, the geologists have sort of deemed it safe. So people now visit Montserrat and you can see the, the survivor, Montserrat Oriole, which is again, one of that banana group, the bananivorous long and associated with palms often in, in some parts of its breeding, at least to get the, um, the way it makes its nest. And um, another island, Martinique, um, has another Oriole, which is, and St. Lucia has a different Oriole. The, a lot of these Caribbean Orioles have almost like umber chestnut orange colors that are really, really attractive. And they're not always very common. So it takes a while to, uh, to find them. The Lesser Antilles are great also for endemic parrots, multiple parrots that are also, again, kind of different from the ones in on the mainland. This one's called the Vinci. That's the national bird of St. Vincent. And uh, people say it has the colors of the flag, uh, the Vinci. And D Dominica is a great place for, for parrots as well. One of the things that struck me when I was visiting these different islands, that if you go to the different islands and you look at the care of grackles, which are often quite common, not always common, all the ones in the north of the Lesser Antilles had females that were very pale like this. Then in the south, they had middle sort of darkness. And in Barbados, the females looked actually just almost like males. The males are fully black, like you expect on a shiny black um, grackle. And their song types actually match their female types. And I think there's something going on here. There might be multiple species of carob grackles, but it gets back to the earliest point I made. Um, nobody looks at 
common birds. And these birds can be common, you know, the, the ones that are sort of feeding right around the hotel, you know, tables. And, um, but something very interesting might be going on that's right, you know, underneath everyone's eyes, just because everybody's looking out for some rare, you know, um, <laughs> warbler, you know, <laughs> it's different, different whistling warblers or something else elsewhere rather than yeah, back at the hotel where some new stuff might actually be discovered. Um, Lesser Antilles have these crazy rents, house rents. These are all actually considered house rents currently. There's a proposal right now. Um, it might have to be revamped later um, have in the you know, AOS committee uh, to separate these birds as different species, but they look different, they sound different, they have really different habitats, um, depending on which type there are, but all of these currently are considered house wrens. And let me tell you, they're not, <laughs> there's something else going on. And as we get, you know, to South America, you know, you sort of think of South America in the North, uh, the, the tropical part, more oropendulas, you know, there's multiple species of oropendulas, some in the Andes, like the russet backs and olive oropendulas in the lowlands, green oropendulas, crested oropendulas are often the most common. And I wanted to play you crested oropendula because it, this is again a picture of the sound um, of this bird song. And there's a couple of things going on here. I'm gonna move, I have to move a bit here, there. If you think about um, these low areas down here, these are all low pitches down low, and then these are high. So when this line is drooping like this and they're drooping multiple lines, this is actually a dropping frequency. This is going from high pitch to low pitch. Now, if you look at the same time, there's this low pitch kind of rattly bit that's going through the whole time. This bird is making two different sounds at the same time. It's making a low pitch set of notes and then it's making a, a higher pitch set of notes and it droops at the same time. So it's the syrinx, you know, it's divided into two. Birds can make one complete different sound than the other. The way I sort of try to think about this is, can you imagine if I was talking to you right now and at the same time that I'm talking in English, I'm talking in Spanish, right? I, if I could do that, that'd be really cool. Um, but birds can actually do this. And then it, it's doing this while it's, you know, dropping, like it's sort of half upside down on a branch and it's making these two sounds. And then at the end, it makes these funny sounds here, which are all actually wing noises. So listen to this whole crazy thing. It's a crazy song. I'll just play it again so you can kind of imagine, like almost concentrate on the low pitch bits because yeah. the higher pitch drooping sound will actually come up. More. I didn't I didn't get the sound on that one. Can you No? Oh, there it goes. Okay, here it comes. Okay, there we go. Let me try to start again. There we go. Weird. I hopefully, hopefully you heard that one. Yeah. No, that time it was it was didn't hear it that time. Heard it, heard it the second time, but not the third time. Oh. Okay. Try it once more. Let's see. Did you hear it? No. That's weird. Oh. Oh, there we heard a little of the rattling. That's weird. It's like it's super loud on my side. And yeah. Well, uh, I'll have to I'll have to send you all a personal email with this sound in it so you can we can put it somewhere else so you can hear it. Um and it it's pretty wild. Let me let me, you know, I wish I could do it, but I can't I can't do the two sounds at the same same time kind of thing. In South American caciques, you know, there's multiple species, red, red rump caciques, mountain caciques, yellow rump caciques. Um, this yellow rump is like the oropendula is that it nests in these clump situations. I like them that the ones that are really clumped have the highest degree of, of um, survivorship. And 
what is really wild about yellow rump caciques is that females go in, the young female goes in and tries to make a nest the first year. And she's basically bullied out of the colony. They won't let her. And it'll take her like two or three seasons, maybe like till year three, that she can you know, be allowed in. And by that point, she's become bigger. She actually gains, gains mass and becomes a little bit more able to sort of fend off kind of the bullying. And then she's allowed to, to nest and will become bigger and eventually move in with a gang of females that accept her. And once she's accepted to a group, she's allowed to stay for the rest of her life. And once she's accepted to the group, she starts becoming smaller again because she doesn't have to defend herself. She's already in. And this is one of the weirdest things that I've ever heard of a bird doing. And it's all separate from the fact that the males are themselves having a sort of race against each other on size and ability sort of fend each other off so that they can, you know, um, mate with these females. And if we get you know, from the lowlands going to the Andes, I want to say that the bird I most want to see, uh, one of the birds I most want to see in my life I've never seen is a red-bellied grackle. It's not a grackle, but it's a really cool bird that is endemic to Colombia. And uh, when I wrote the book, um, Colombia was not accessible to birders. Unfortunately, it is right now. And if you listen to our um, podcast, you know, we actually have a whole one um, recently about Colombia with one of the, the experts there and you should check it out. Um, in terms of oddball or appendula cacique kind of things, I wanna point out too, there's one, this very kind of dull looking black um, bird called the yellow-billed cacique because it has this sort of bird, uh, bill that's very pale. And in many places, it's a real bamboo specialist. You only find it in bamboo or in real thickets. And it happens to be the oldest branch of all of the caciques and oropendula. So this is sort of the great granddaddy of all caciques and oropendulas. And I think it's interesting that it's dull, it's black, it's got yellow eyes, but there's no yellow anywhere, nothing. The second branch, the second oldest is this West Mexican yellow winged cacique, which is really kind of already a fancy looking bird. And from there on in, you know, all caciques and orpendulas tend to be relatively fancy. Um, relatively, they're not all. There's one called a solitary cacique that's dark. But um, if we get into wetlands down south, there are multiple species. I showed you yellow hooded blackbird earlier. This is the chestnut capped blackbird, the unicolored blackbirds that are in these sort of tropical marshy areas. And some like the trupial will sort of venture. It's an oriole, but it'll venture into marshy areas at times. The chestnut cap, cap blackbird is, um, um, it's one that nests a little bit more like our red wings in marsh or marsh edges. And there's often a big group of them, males and females. And they don't, um, they're not quite as territorial. I wouldn't call them colonial, but in this group, males make the nests, the females don't. And the, the males attract females by nest making. And in, in Uruguay, they're, they're known as Garibaldis and they're named for the red coats of Giuseppe Garibaldi, who is a very important figure in the I Italy's uh, wars, you know, back in the 1800s. But Garibaldi also went to South America and fought in the Uruguayan Civil War. And his group always wore red coats. So the bird, because of its red, reddish, kind of dark reddish on its head is known as the um, Garibaldi. And we go now to the far south, sort of towards the end of so South America, um, a part where I'm from, Chile. This is, this is um, the Torres del Paine. And um, it's a place where I've spent a lot of time, both as a, as a child and then as an adult, as a birder and bird tour leader, and a place uh, where my family's from. So I have a great um, love for this country and its bird life. And also the fact that it's just a beautiful place to visit. This is the far north near Peru, Bolivia. Um, this is more down south central, close to where my parents were born. And this is Ta Patagonia, Torres del Paine, just a beautiful part of the world. The southernmost blackbird, Icterid of all, breeds there. This is the Austral blackbird, which Austral means southern, 
like boreal means northern, southern is austral. This is the austral parakeet. So a lot of birds here are called austral this, Magellanic that, you know, southern this. And this is the one that actually that red, you know, scarlet hooded blackbird is related to this bird, even though this one has no flesh color. When you get down here uh, to the pampas, some of it, and you know, some of the Patagonian um, grasslands, they look similar to parts of North America, you know, except for the rias running around, except for the fact that the, you know, marsh birds, yellow rump marsh birds might be around. And in some places, it's a little bit more habitats we don't see here, like this palm savanna in Uruguay, and the cowboys known as gauchos down there. Um, yet there are a lot of marsh nesting blackbirds, just like these, this um, scarlet headed and this yellow winged blackbird. And one of the interesting things is to contrast marsh nesting blackbirds, icterids down there with the ones up north. Up north, they have much more food. The productivity of marshes in North America is actually really high compared to the productivity of marshes in temperate South America. And that means the number of bugs essentially and stuff being produced. So they have less food in South America. And many of these marsh nesting blackbirds in the South are never polygynous. And in fact, this um, scarlet hooded, it, uh, scarlet headed is, uh, forms pair bonds that it maintains year round and the males and females are exactly the same in coloration. Completely different from Northern marsh nesting blackbirds. The, um, we have bobolinks that winter there and bobolinks, at least in the Northern part of that Southern section of South America, bobolinks are cool birds. Um, they look cool, they sound cool. They have one of the longest migrations in the new world of any land bird, any sort of passerine bird. You know, you can add a few, a couple of swallows there, barn swallow, cliff swallow, maybe Connecticut warbler, Swainson's thrush, um, older flycatcher, but bobolink is truly a um, marvel in migration. They're also unusual in that they have two entire complete molts per year. So rather than having you know, shedding the wings only once a year, like most birds, these birds do it twice. And I'll have you guess what other North American bird has a two molts. And you have to think about something that migrates a good distance. So keep that in mind. Um, this beautiful icterid, the saffron cull blackbird is rare. And the black and white monjita, which is a flycatcher, is rare as well. They both need old growth grasslands and they appear to collaborate. It's an odd situation, but uh, William Belton, back in the day, he noticed that when you saw one, you tended to see the other. And his theory is that what the, the monjitas do is they sit up higher, the blackbirds are all down low, and as the blackbird flock moves through, they scare up bugs and the flycatcher, the monjita eats the bugs. And if a raptor or somebody comes, the monjita lets the blackbirds know and then they all seek cover. So they have like this um, relationship where, you know, <laughs> the right hand helps left hand. And it is sad to see that this situation is becoming less and less common to see as these two birds are becoming rarer due to habitat uh, changes, but I've seen it and it's really quite interesting to see them kind of both going along together in these grasslands in Uruguay or northern Argentina. Um, cowbirds are common also throughout the New World and in the far south there are multiple cowbirds. This is a rufous collar sparrow feeding a shiny cowbird and if you look at sort of other species of cowbirds, you know, we have shiny, we have our brown headed, we have our bronzed, and there is also giant cowbird. And these um, birds, um, you might have heard of the bison story, right? That they are brood parasites. So that's why that sparrow was feeding that cowbird. They trick other birds into feeding their, you know, their young, laying their eggs into, into the nests of sparrows and vireos and all sorts of other species. And the idea that people proposed was that these cowbirds would follow the bison and then, you know, brute parasitism sort of evolved through this magical way 
And then they didn't have to stay in any one place and nest. They could just drop eggs all the way along and follow the migration of the bison. Unfortunately, it's not true because by the time cowbirds got to North America, they already were cowbirds. Cowbirds evolved in South America as brood parasites, actually parasitizing or pendulas and other blackbirds before they became generalists. And by that point, they got to North America and they might have gone, hey, bison, I love this, you know, and then been able to sort of roam with them freely. But it's not because of the bison that cowbirds became brood parasites, which is often what people are told. This is the giant cowbird. And um, I won't say too much about it, except that if you have heard of the whole story of Thayer's goal and this guy, Neil Smith, that made up all of his data and kind of fooled everybody into believing that he'd figured out that Thayer's gulls and Iceland gulls were different species. When, after he left the Arctic, he went to work in the tropics and he worked on cowbirds. He worked on giant cowbirds and oropendulas. And he also had this amazing set of, of papers that appear to have been made up. They're completely fibs, complete you know, <laughs> generation of false data. Uh, and uh, I won't say any more about that. You can ask me questions about it later, but it's pretty weird. But so I studied cowbirds and I'll sort of end with this bit. And you're gonna ask why? And to put it into perspective, when I was a student, an undergrad, I had a summer, well, I had an after school job that was not that different from you know, the movie High Fidelity, but in, in, except we weren't selling records, we were selling books. And I, I worked at a bookstore that was essentially just about travel and nature. So we had all the field guides, we had all the maps, we had all the travel books. And sometimes in the middle of the day, nobody came around and I just sat there and read books. And one book I read was The Naturalist in La Plata by this guy, William Henry Hudson. And Hudson was superb writer. He grew up in Argentina. He moved to England. He was one of the first members of the Royal Society of Protection of Birds. He was an avian conservationist before it was cool to be a conservationist. He wrote with detail on the behavior of birds. And he wrote about cowbirds. And he wrote about shiny cowbird and this other cowbird in Argentina called the screaming cowbird. And they're very similar. Screaming is not as shiny and it's got a thicker bill. It's got a little more, more reddish eye. It's a little different. But what's really unique here is that a shiny cowbird is like our brown-headed cowbird. It parasitizes all sorts of species. Screaming cowbird in that part of the world only parasitizes a bird called the bay wing. In that time, this was called the bay wing cowbird because it looks kind of like a cowbird, except it's gray, I mean, in shape, and it's got these rusty wings. And it was thought that these birds were related, but they're not, actually. Uh, the bay wing is not a cowbird at all. And if you look in the little, um, little group, these are cowbirds. These are all the cowbirds over here. It actually says cowbirds there. But the bay wing is up here, way up here. It's actually most closely related to this bird, the Bolivian blackbird. Um, and then it makes the story pretty interesting because at the time I was studying um, eggs in the nest and um, also this idea of what these cowbirds look like. Because, see, screaming cowbirds are black and they have a little rusty on the underwing. This is from our book. And then bay wings are gray with the rusty wings and so forth. And this is a juvenile bay wing down here. But look, this is a juvenile screaming cowbird. That looks exactly like that. So these birds lay their eggs into the nests of this bird and then act like them, sound like them, do everything like them. They're mimics. And at the time, it was thought they were related. So this wasn't that weird. But I knew it was weird. I didn't think these things were related. They're actually mimicking. It's everything about the bay wing. And then when they grow up and they fledge, they become black. And you can see this one still has some of that color left over. So here is what these things look like. This is the most amazing thing. This is the adult bay wing. This is the adult screaming. This is the juvenile screaming. This is the juvenile bay wing. 
I, the way I used to identify them was by the, the shape of their nostril and to some extent how dark the lores are. Um, and if you saw the underwing, the uh, screaming has dark underwings versus the bay wing has pale underwings. But most of the time you could not identify them or you had trouble even in the hand, you have to look at really specific features. It is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about this still, that these birds have evolved to look like the other one to fully trick them, like really, really trick them into raising their young. And um, so there you go. I think they're among the coolest birds in the world. And I told you a bunch of stuff about them and my experience with them. And hopefully I've convinced you that they're pretty all right. And if you're interested in bird trips, Alvarez Adventures, or we have this new membership site with bird identification information, birdingyourbestlife.com. But thank you so much. Hopefully there's a few questions. That was wonderful, Al. Thank you very, very much. And yeah, we have quite a few questions. Yeah, but thank you so much. You stop, should I stop the share here. Oh, there you uh, go. There you go. Um, but while we're waiting for more questions to come in, can you talk a little bit about, we all love our old Mugles. And then AOS changed the name. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've done with, the, with your request? I, I, wrote, I wrote a proposal to go back to Mugol. Um, a, because I like Mugol. <laughs> B, B uh, because the name um, Mugol was at least in, in, in our modern world applied just to the new world population. So the one in Asia, Europe, there were two names for that, Common Goal and Kamchatka Goal. Right. So there was already sort of a division in English names that made sense to most people who are alive right now. And it's really parallel to, you know, Black Scoter was separated, Common Scoter and Velvet Scoter was an old name, White Wing Scoter. And I didn't think there was a necessity to change names. And I think that confusion is greater if you actually change the name, although the reason they were changing the name was to minimize confusion, I think it's increased confusion. I also think that names that have been, a, you know, that there's a, this idea of, of maintaining uh, or, or reverting to an older name, and that's called stability. And I think in this case, most you know, living people never knew Short Bill Gull, which was an old name. It actually is a valid name, but um, I, I think there's an element of, we have to think about this today and the effect it has on people today and the confusion it creates today. It's a different world than it was even 30 years ago in birding. And this just to me was not necessary. And uh, we could have kept a really, I think a cool name like Mugol just sounds nice. I don't know. It even gives you an idea of something cute, a cute sounding name, <laughs> more so than small, you know, short bill goal. Um, that, that sounds clinical to me. I don't know. I know, I know, I'll, yeah, there's multiple arguments as to why um, <laughs> and why it's happened. So John Dunn says the goal motion failed unanimously. And I think that is not a good thing for the committee, to tell you the truth because I, I don't know why they would, um, you know, do that and be inconsistent and then not want to sort of re-look through this and think about the people that use these names. And it might be a reason why that committee may not need to do the English names. They should do the taxonomy and the English names should be done by a different group of people. It's my thought, but, you know. Oh, well. well Mark, there are a few questions coming there, in. There are. We could go get back to. Uh, I, I didn't uh, choose to to talk about the Mugol, by the way, John. I, was, I know. That was no, wrong. no, I, I, I twisted your arm. I yeah, Ron, yeah, Ron <laughs> tell you up on that. I, I didn't mention. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, on, so, uh, taxonomy so me, updates coming up in the in the future, so we can, you know, sort of put that kind of discussion off to when we have a full discussion of in October. Uh, in October. With, oh, okay. with John and Kimball. 
And, All right. and I should say that I am part of one of these committees and I'm part of the South American version of this committee, of the AO's committee. So I know how they work. I know, you know, I'm not going into this sort of, um, I just think somebody needs to start, you know, trying to make people realize that they're not doing this in a vacuum, that it affects, right. you know, hundreds of thousands of people when you change names. Um, and and it, it it has to have some kind of cultural, you know, you know, thought, you know, that is, it ceases to be science when you're talking about English names. You, you know, science is the taxonomy. The English name is now a cultural realm, you know, so I think it's two different things. So I've... <laughs> Oh, okay. Great. No, thank you. Great. This thank is you. very, very interesting. And, and, and Ron set you up for that. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. We should get back to, to Ictris. I just want to um, put a, a comment that Lance made um, regarding rusty blackbirds. Uh, the breeding bird atlases are underway in Maine, Ontario, Newfoundland, and New York. So more information will be available in a few years. The atlas in Quebec also finished recently. Uh, those states and provinces cover a significant fraction of the breeding range. So we will probably know more about rusty blackbirds. Um, yeah, um, although, you know, there's a lot of land up there. And I, I remember some of the Ontario birders, not, they didn't think there was a decline in rusty blackbirds. Well, the American birders that saw them in the non-breeding season thought there was a big decline. So it's interesting. It's an interesting thing to think yeah. about. Yeah. Right. Um, we have a, a question in the chat from, so I happen to be looking at that up by uh, uh, Christine. Do you think oh. they will add yellow-breasted chat, since this is why she put it in the chat, of course. Uh, do you think they will add uh, yellow-breasted chat to the Ictrid family? Um, I don't think so, because the, I think the branch length is far enough out that if you did that, to be consistent, you would have to lump a bunch of other things into other families if I'm remembering that correctly. And it's, it's uncomfortable to have a single species family. It really is. But um, we now have several branches that are like that, especially in the Caribbean, you know, with, um, um, yeah, Puerto Rican, um, was it um, Puerto Rican um, tanager and, you know, the spindalis and these things, there's sort of few species and sort of not really related to anything at all. <laughs> <laughs> generally nine primary bird Aussies, but okay. yeah, I think it won't be, but yeah. Okay, great. great, great, great. <laughs> um, uh, Thomas asks, how do monkeys reach the nests of Orm pendulas? Hmm. Monkeys are wild that, you know, like <laughs> the, so capuchins, spider monkeys, they, they'll, they'll go to the branches and, you know, Try to grab things, but that's why the orpendulas nest right at the tips, so that the monkey essentially falls off. You know, so the clumps tend to be right at the tips rather than inside. And you'd think that would be the dumbest place to put your nest because the wind would take them away. So there's a bit of wind issue with orpendulas, but monkeys, you know, otherwise they would get all the nests if they were closer to to the the bigger branches. And the, often they'll choose a tree that's out isolated in an open area, so. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Sequoia asks, can you give us a source on the debunked myth of the cowbird? I guess this must be the bison myth. Yeah. Yeah, um, so if you look at the, the sort of family tree of cowbirds, the earliest uh, two, the cowbirds, the ones that sort of appeared earliest are giant cowbird and screaming cowbird from South America. Then we have, bronze cowbird and then shiny and 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 brown headed so the cowbirds already existed and were you know theoretically already um brood parasites so the last ones that sort of arrived one of them was brown headed so by that point they were already were cowbirds they were doing that thing and then they met the bison uh, so <laughs> so i think the idea that the bison sort of caused this, I think, can be debunked. The fact that they could get in there and hang out with bison because they had this way of living, that makes sense. Right. Where did that myth come from? I don't know. 
I, it's probably one of the old texts, you know, maybe Bent, Arthur Cleveland Bent, or somebody in there that sort of said, this must be why, you know. <laughs> hmm. Huh. Okay, great. Um, Lily asks, is it true that male or pendulas drop the nests that the females build if they don't like them? Um, it's, it, there might, there's probably a lot going on and some of it that I haven't kept up with. Um, but um, it's likely better for the male to actually, you know, not do that. And it's possible that they do that when they're aggressive and they're chasing other males around and sort of everybody kind of gets in the fold, uh, the messiness of it, just like, you know, baby um, elephant seals getting squished, you know, in the, in the tumult of mating. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and Lance asks, can you please discuss the origin of cacique and why the pronunciation is often French rather than Spanish? Given the species is common in many Spanish speaking countries, it's puzzling that the pronunciation usually sounds French. Um, I think that's, you know, kind of classic English. We, we accept pronunciation that is the common one often rather than uh, being specific to the origin, but the, the word is cacique, right? Cacique in, in Spanish would, uh, you know, often be a, a elder in, you know, in a sort of um, First Nations group, um, the cacique. But um, why it's cacique? I don't know. I mean, we, we have a lot of people say jacana rather than jasana or, you know, arasari. We, yeah. I'm yeah. <laughs> at a loss to explain. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Are there any other? Uh, oh, John Dunn says uh, Neil Smith for the bison story. Oh, um, oh. That's where the bison story comes from. Says. Really? <laughs> um, He's, Neil Smith caused a lot of trouble, but he, <laughs> he, um, he proposed that giant cowbirds, when they went in and parasitized the nests of oropendulas, this, this Smith guy, the, the giant cowbirds plucked the botfly larvae from the young, so it was beneficial to have a brood parasite bird in your nest. And that there was uh, all this stuff going on that even some of the displays, you know, were to bring giant cowbirds in to the area and so forth. So this is essentially all been debunked. They tried to redo his, his um, project and it, you know, nothing, yeah, nothing worked out. But uh, Neil Smith should be given a medal for basically pulling the wool over the eyes of multiple people in different institutions for in a multi-decade long career. Right. Okay, well, John said he was just kidding about the bison story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought so, but I didn't. I didn't want to say, you know, John Dunn is wrong, you know. <laughs> Great. Um, and of course, you have the, uh, another uh, uh, question that, that of course had to come up, um, which is, okay. what is the other uh, North American First. bird that molts twice a year? And maybe just do some of the young birders, uh, uh, the, the Lab S uh, people know that. Because they might. Mm -hmm. Do you think about it? You need to molt twice, probably because you're going a long distance, you know, in, in migration. North American bird. Um, and um, else, what other hint? I, I, I'm seeing it in the chat. Yeah. So somebody got it? Yep, yep. So Ava says, uh, says Franklin's gull. Yeah, Franklin's gull. It's the only other one. Yeah. Good, good trivia question. Yeah. <laughs> Just want to point out that Ava is a student birder. All right. Oh, cool. That's why I mentioned the student birders because I figured that, you know, they're really good and I, I, I knew one of them would know <laughs> that. They, they know all this stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, 
it's great. Um, young birders are always so keen and, you know, uh, also just gobble information up. Yeah. And that's, that's super to see. I mean, I, yeah. I started as an 11 year old myself, so I remember. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, so we have a few more uh, Q&A questions. Lance asks, which Icterid is probably in greatest danger of extinction? Ooh. Um, it's a good question. There's, um, I haven't kept up with some of it, but there's Forbes Blackbird is in this little set of spots, you know, in in um, Brazil, Selva Cacique, Cacique. Um, the the yellow-shouldered blackbird is probably um, okay because it's in Puerto Rico and it's getting a certain amount of funding. I'm um, probably missing Montserrat Oriole is is likely okay, but it's in a small, very small population. So yeah, I, I'm probably not answering the question, but there's give you a few things to research. <laughs> Great. Um... And Lily asks, do you think that the bicolored blackbirds could have been a separate species sometime in the past before being engulfed by? I, yeah, I think, I think so. Um, the, the genetics show that really weird. Um, I didn't think that, I thought that the Mexican, central Mexican, there's a population that's bicolored as well, like, and they look very similar. I, I thought that was an independent thing just sort of happened to look alike. But it turns out that ours and theirs, the Mexican and California are close, are more closely related to each other. And I I do think that they sound different, the call notes. The moment I, I get to a place that has sort of typical um, red wings, the, the call notes to me remind me more of, of Brewer's Blackbird. There's a lot going on. Mm. And I say it's kind of a really gray area. like. And so, some people might still consider them different species. Others might be hesitant because of this weird history that they seem to. Um, and then in Mexico, there's one place where they actually don't hybridize with the local red wings and another place where they do. So hmm. that's even, that's, that's in between too. So yeah, that's a <laughs> question that needs to be kind of tackled with more data. Great. And we have another question by John Dunn. Tell us about bronzed cowbirds in that females are of two colors. Both are scarce in West Texas, but what about the isthmus of wherever that is, Tuantepec? Tuantepec. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Um, the, the division of sort of Eastern bronze cowbird and Western bronze cowbird needs to be looked at in more detail and maybe some of the genetics folks could Get in there and there's also this isolated population in northernmost Colombia and called the bronze brown cow there's there's a lot going on that I don't know much about except it's like a little hmm you know hopefully somebody will look at this I do think though that in gray tail grackles the western gray tail grackle is so different in voice and even some as aspects of its um, nesting habitat and so forth from the more eastern great tail grackle that that bears more study and the genetics show also some that support that great great um let's see do we have any more questions i think we're out of questions i might have answers <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh here, here's a good question oh, no. by Lance. Oh, two more questions. Okay, They're popping three more in. questions. Wow, we're getting we're getting rolled over here. Um, Lance asks, when will the next edition of Birds of Chile appear, and what will change? Ooh, um, I well, that's a that's a complicated question because we've actually <laughs> wanted to do that book, but we haven't been able to because of, um, uh, you know, sort of. I wouldn't call it contractual stuff, but uh, what's going on with another Chilean book that, that is out there in the market. And we, we may not be able to do anything until something is resolved there in, in terms of the, the publisher deciding our book is 
done, if we're done and we're, you know, have the rights back, then we could redo it. But, uh, or, or yeah, it's one of those things like that's kind of beyond our control, but uh, maybe we should do an app and that's, that's the way to get around it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but what would change? We would, um, boy, we would add a few species. <clears throat> You know, sort of splits and and um, up, update some of the plates. Not all the plates are maybe up to the caliber of of what we would like them to be at this point in time. And we've learned a lot about identification of certain species. Oh yeah, lots, lots. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Britta asks if I could only go to one island you recommended. Which <laughs> one has the most varied number of icterids? Number of icterids. Um, that's a good question. Um, I think as a, uh, the island that has the most, I think, I think it's still the case, has the most number of endemic birds in the Caribbean is Cuba. So that that is a I would and it's an island I've been to country that I I've been to many times. I think it's a fascinating country for many reasons. So it's a lot of good birding there. Um, I'm not sure, does it? I mean, it probably has the highest number of victories. I kind of trying to count them off the top, top of my head. But the smaller the island, the fewer the species. And so, you know, um, but I'd love to go to Jamaica, like I said, for my not having been there. But it doesn't have as many victories. As, <laughs> as <people. laughs> Great. Uh, Nancy asked, do brown-headed cow cowbirds in Southern California have a preference of where to, to lay their eggs? For example, yellow warbler versus dark-eyed junco nests. Um, the, I guess, preference of species. Yeah, yeah um, that's a really, if you look at the cowbirds, they, the, the sort of older lineages of cowbirds all tend to uh, specialize on other blackbirds, all other icterids. Yeah. So, okay. Giant cowbirds only go for caciques and rapendulas. That screaming cowbird likes the bay wing. In some places, they go for the choppy blackbird. And now they've arrived in Chile and are starting to learn to uh, use the austral blackbird. But they're all icterids. A bronze cowbird is a little in between in that it's thought that it probably started as an oriole specialist. And then it's become more general over time. But then the other two, shiny and brown-headed are all over the place, complete generalists. So we've gone from a specialist to a generalist situation over evolutionary time. And ev evolutionary biologists say that what will eventually happen is that all of those lineages will become specialized again because the birds that are hosts will develop um, counter, you know, sort of counter cowbird situations and it has to become more and more specialized like in cuckoos or, you know, uh, the Vidua finches, cuckoo finch, and all these other things in, in the old world that are brood parasites. Hmm. <laughs> Long answer, sorry. Oh, that's great. Oh. <laughs> um, so uh, NECC is voting on the Columbia Cowbird issue now. I assume SACC is? Probably not yet because they, they that often uh, one waits for the other to finish before this is my what I've seen in the past mm -hmm. I, I you know yeah makes sense I guess you don't want to have like you want to see everybody else's comments be kind of um, kind of strange to have North America and South America kind of vote different ways on the same bird but they can. Well, that's interesting. So the yeah, they can. They can, and they and they have. I think they have, but I'm. Yeah, I think they have, but I'm not sure. Like, actually, that's a good question. Hmm. Something to research. Yeah. Um, yeah, young birders, go and research that one. Yeah. There we go. So yeah, the North American checklist. Committee and South American differ and differ that's on at the same time. Anyways, it looks like we're out of questions and chats and 
but not ignorance. We'll always have no. ignorance. <laughs> the extra eye there. We're out of the. the, yeah. the yeah. You'll Chad have the ignorance extra in your heart. <laughs> Avaro, thank you very, very much for presenting for us tonight. I, we it was very enjoyable. We everyone liked it. We had a lot of questions that came through, and uh, and fact, I think we're having one more come through. Yeah, now I have a whole list of ictoras I want to see. I don't know how they look, but they're cool behavior too. Yeah, no, they they really are pretty pretty neat. Um, oh, I, I I'm not sure what John does this. I'm not sure what that oh, is. Oh, John S. W G A C pushing this. Is that the Colombian <laughs> covert issue again? I'm not sure. What I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but um, I, I do want to say that, you know, I, 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 there was a part of my life that was so dedicated to these birds, and it's a long time ago, and every so often when I get asked to do this talk and I sort of revamp it, I get to relive just some beautiful memories, yeah. so I just thank you for allowing me to share some of this, and I know it was a whirlwind kind of thing, but... <laughs> No, it's Maybe fantastic. Thank different you. Different than different than me going through that goal ID, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it it really was fantastic. Thank you very much, and we're getting Thanks. lots of comments. Thank you as well. Um, well I just you. want to remind everyone that next week, uh, or next week, yeah, next week, we're going to be talking about uh, sparrows. So please mm -hmm. join John and Kimball and LA Burgers for that. And once again, thank you very much, Alvaro. Uh, Alvaro, sorry. <laughs> I'm stressing the wrong thing. <laughs> wrong symbol. Um, <laughs> we will see everyone next week. And in the meantime, have a good week. Thank you, Alvaro. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really thank enjoyable. You. Thanks for your efforts. Thanks. Thanks a Take lot. Take care, everyone. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.